Welcome to the fifth biennial Future Vision. It's great to see you all here today. So I'm Professor Pete Seal from the Department of Journalism and Media Communication here at CSU, and I'd like to welcome you as the co-chair of this event with David Ramsey, who is my partner in crime on this. Our purpose today is to talk about a variety of perspectives from experts who are right here on how the expansive fields of information and communication technology might evolve over the next five years. So the purpose of this is really to look at the next five years, because beyond five years, it's hard to make predictions that are accurate. And really, it's for students. Uh, how many of you are students here today? Students? Great. That's, this is really for you. Because we're describing your future. This is your future that you're going to be graduating into. So, and uh, I'd like to just thank a few people in the process who've helped put this on. First of all, I thank our sponsors. Uh, Apple, uh, the Jeffrey Holmes Communication and Technology Scholarship Fund, uh, McGraw-Hill Education, and Intel. So these, these people make it possible to put this event on for you. Also, a special thanks to Ramtech and Double Robot for logistical support. And just a word about Jeff Holmes. Jeff Holmes was an economics graduate from CSU back in the 80s, and he started with a small parking company called Kennedy National Services, which later became Warner Communications, which later became Time Warner. So uh, he made a very generous donation to us to support education here at CSU. So I'd like to thank Jeff Holmes for his support and all of our sponsors, especially Apple. So this is the NIST Tech project, and I'm going to invite Edwin Chong to come up here. Edwin, you come and join me right now. Uh, it's at the Information Science and Technology Center at CSU, and I'm going to have Edwin talk a little bit about uh, the purpose of NIST Tech. So, Edwin, thank you very much. Welcome to all. On behalf of NIST Tech and all of our participants on campus and throughout the state of Colorado, I'd like to welcome you to the Future Visions 2020 Symposium. We're fortunate to have representatives from many members of our Industrial Advisory Council here with us today as we hosted that spring meeting here on campus this morning. In the immortal words of our prior director, H.J. Siegel, the mission of ISTEC is to promote, facilitate, and enhance CSU's research, education, and outreach activities pertaining to the design and innovative application of computer communication and information systems. We do this by building relationships between faculty and departments on campus, involved in teaching and conducting research on information and communication technologies. As part of our land-grant mission here at CSU, we reach out statewide to build bridges to information and communication technology industries through our Industrial Advisory Council. We hold biannual meetings on campus and at their companies to communicate what we've uh, done and are doing at CSU and hear about innovations in new technologies from them. We also bring high school students to campus to participate in events such as our high school day over the past decade and with our new national teams competition. Another new development this year is ISTEC's participation in the National Vertically Integrated Projects or VIP program. Uh, this is an engineering uh, oriented uh, and interdisciplinary education program that operates in a research and development context to involve CSU students in creative problem solving uh, and team efforts with faculty guidance. We're excited about the potential for the VIP program to enhance students' learning in multiple information and communication technology fields. Uh, ISTEC also uh, is the home of our information science and technology minor on campus. Uh, which now has 93 students enrolled. And now I'll turn uh, the podium back to our moderator, Dr. Pete Seal. Great. Thank you, Edwin. <clears throat> so while, while Edwin was speaking, uh, I got the word that our next speaker, our fearless leader, Dr. Pat Burns, has, has been delayed. He's supposed to be, do the welcome to you folks. So he's been delayed coming back to Fort Collins from DIA. I've been told that in case he was late, he made arrangements for somebody else to, to do the welcome. So, and David, who was that going to be? Rick, Rick oh, um, so. Uh, <laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. Well, what a great turnout today. Well, on behalf of uh, Colorado State University and the administration here, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to Future Visions 2020. Uh, this is the 10th year that uh, ISTEC and CSU have been uh, hosted this Biennial uh, Futures Conference. And let me look out to the, to the group here. It looks packed. This is fantastic. Uh, what a great turnout. 
And uh, you know, I couldn't see earlier how many students are in the room. So could you raise your hands again and give me a good chance on that? Oh, excellent. This is fantastic. You know, maybe I'll just walk, uh, walk a little bit uh, over to the, uh, to the center of the stage here um, so I can get a better read on where, what you all look like. Excellent, excellent. Well, look, I'm very pleased to see just, just a great turnout. You know, digital uh, information and communication technologies are something everybody uh, realizes is central to uh, this university and to really uh, e everything that everyone in our society does these days. Um, CSU's been a leader in this area for over 44 years. Uh, lately, we've used the ISTEC platform to promote that. And um, we continue to break ground constantly in all sorts of interesting areas of research and education, including high performance computing, uh, data security issues, application design, uh, applied game research, uh, brain computer interfaces, um, and develop an, development of all sorts of innovative communication technologies as well. You know, this, uh, this is a dangerous little uh, uh, communication technology myself that I'm involved in this, uh, this afternoon. You know, there, there isn't anyone on this campus who goes to more meetings than I'd go, go to as the provost and executive vice president. And uh, if Tony Frank hears that we have this available to me, he's going to ask me to go to double the number of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so this could be a disaster waiting to happen for me personally. So I just want to, <laughs> uh, well, anyway, I'm delighted to, uh, to be able to welcome you here today. And uh, thanks to you all for coming. Uh, and uh, look forward to the afternoon of, uh, of some uh, presentations. Thanks very much. So I want to introduce the man behind the curtain. <laughs> they told me I could probably drive this from my office the back of the admin building, but we were a little scared to do that. So <laughs> anyway, again, thanks for everyone for coming today. Have a great afternoon. Hey, thank you, Rick. They were testing this out on Wednesday, so David took it over. David arranged for David Ramsey arranged for this demo. They took the double rubbit over to administration and they had Rick test it out. So he was cruising into people's offices. You know, there's the, oh, there's a provost. It isn't the provost, it's a virtual provost. So he was frightening people. He, unfortunately, Tony Frank wasn't in or he would have scared Tony too. So, but I think you have to see him using this to attend meetings in the future. So thank you, Rick, for joining us. I appreciate that. So thank you for that. And uh, Pat Burns will be with us later. He will be uh, here later to uh, do the conclusion. And uh, he'll, get, he'll be here after he gets back from DIA. Just a couple more housekeeping items. Um, I do want to thank, it takes a lot of people to put this event on. This is a small list of people in the ISTEC group who were involved in terms of planning future visions. And we worked on this for over a year, getting all this put together. Everybody pitched in, helped out with different committees. So Edwin, Patrick, Anura, Candace, Stephen, Don, Sidipto, Ali, Sid, Scott, and Shradeep. Thank you for your support of this event. We couldn't do it without you. You guys really have been incredibly helpful in putting this event on. And other people involved, Dave Ramsey is the co-chair for Future Visions. He was instrumental in setting up the double, the double uh, uh, demo and also inviting uh, Tara, Tara Bunch to speak with us today. Terry Nash, Bruce Hallmark, Kate, Greg, Beth, Bruce, Andrew, Jason, Chris, Steve for helping with the logistical events and putting this on. So it takes a lot of people to put this event on. So I'd like to thank uh, those folks for helping out with this. So that's it for my part of this. Um, I'd be happy to introduce our first speaker uh, is going to be Phil McKinney. He's the president and CEO of Cable Labs in Louisville near Boulder. And I met with him last week and I went down to talk about the symposium to kind of give a briefing about the intention. It's really about students. It's about their futures, about the next five years. And we're talking, he pointed across the hall and said, oh, by the way, in that lab, we're testing 4K and 8K video. So uh, uh, by the way, if you think your HDTV picture looks good, 4K is astonishing because it's got 4,000 pixels instead of 2,000 pixels, twice as sharp. But at the NAB show in Las Vegas two weeks ago, they were demoing 8K, which is 8,000 pixels. And 8,000 pixels is just breathtaking because it's like there's no TV there. You're looking through a window at the Masters tournament. You're looking at a window at a concert. In this case, it was a Taiko Dojo drumming group that was performing. And it's like you were there standing in front of them watching them perform. So that's what they're testing at Cable Labs. We're looking at how are we going to transmit this because it takes a lot of bandwidth. How are we going to do that? That's kind of research they're doing at Cable Labs. 
So uh, his extensive bio is in the program. You can look up the bio in your program. A few highlights. Uh, he joined Cable Labs in 2012. Before that, he was a chief technical officer for HP's Personal Systems Group, where he worked for over two decades. He's an author. He's the author of Beyond the Obvious, published in 2012, about enhancing one's personal creativity and innovation ability. So we thought he'd be a perfect person to be our keynoter for Future Visions. He hosts a free uh, podcast on iTunes called Killer Innovations. He's also a contributor to Forbes, Forbes Magazine with his column, The Objective. We'd like to welcome Phil to CSU as a leader in the field of digital telecommunication for his talk about innovation and next exponential technologies. So first of all, I want to thank you for having this opportunity. Um, I am new to Colorado. Uh, two years ago, I relocated from Silicon Valley here to Colorado. And uh, so, uh, and actually, this is my first time on the Fort Collins campus. So I uh, grand appreciate the invitation to come up and uh, spend a little bit of time. I'm going to plan on talking for about 25 or 30 minutes. I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. And what I'm going to talk about as we get into this is what I call exponential technologies. But I'm going to bet that even though Cable Labs is headquartered here in Colorado, Cable Labs has been around for 27 years, then I'm going to guess, albeit I know, I, I saw Don Delcino sneak in the audience here somewhere. Oh, there he is. So he's actually a uh, former Cable Labs um, executive. But I'm going to guess that most of you don't even know who Cable Labs is. Cable Labs is the nonprofit tax exempt R&D um, lab for the cable industry. Think of us as the Bell Labs for cable. 210 people based in Louisville. About 180 of those people are engineers and researchers. We are funded by 55 of the largest members. We now operate in 31 countries, supporting 150 million subscribers of cable services. That's all good. That's interesting. The one statistic that I like to quote is more than 50% of all U.S. homes have at least one cable labs technology in the home, yet 99.9% .9 of the average consumer doesn't even know we exist. So here's your test. Go home. If you get your broadband services, uh, high-speed data from your cable provider, walk into your wiring closet, pick up your cable modem, flip it over, look at the bottom, and you'll see cable labs on the bottom of your cable, of your cable modem. Doxis, that technology was created at Cable Labs. So enough of the, the selling, albeit this is more for the students. If you're looking for internships, looking for jobs, we'd love to have a conversation with you because we're constantly, uh, we are constantly looking for the, the best and the brightest. But really, my talk today is around, emerge, around uh, exponential technologies, right? These aren't just technologies on incremental changes, things that happen a little bit at a time, but those that are truly exponential, right? And just to keep it in the back of our mind how impactful exponential technologies are. If I stand on the stage and I take 30 linear paces, I'd probably be out in the courtyard out here. If I do 30 exponential paces, that's 26 times around the Earth. So just to keep in mind the impacts and the kinds of technologies. Now we think of exponential technologies, particularly in the computing world, things like Moore's Law. Right? where I see a compounding improvement every 18 to 24 months on its speed and its reduction in costs. But there's a whole lot of exponential technologies that are emerging and coming on. But when I talk about exponential technologies, I'm going to talk specifically about what I call fundamental or foundational technologies. Now, technologies by themselves are interesting. They're intriguing. What's more exciting is what you do with those kinds of exponential technologies. So my argument is, is exponential technologies lead to exponential ideas. And that really becomes part of the challenge. It's very hard for any of us to think exponentially. We think linear. We get an exponential technology, but we apply it in a linear mode. We look for that next step of, of the innovation or that incremental improvement versus leveraging exponential technologies to come up with expo exponential ideas, which ultimately leads then to exponential innovations, the innovations that have had fundamental change and fundamental impact in all of our lives. Now, this could be a little bit hard to read, but this is actually a chart that shows all U.S. patents granted to U.S. citizens going back to 1790, when the patent laws were put in place and the first patents were issued. And this is an example of where you can start seeing kind of that exponential growth um, just in patents. But it also points out one of the fundamental other challenges of 
How do these innovations happen? If you think of patents as a proxy for innovations, what is kind of the causality factor between other things going on in this exponential growth of technologies or innovations? This particular paper that was put up by the dialogue group argues around networks. It's around people coming together with a variety of disciplines and a variety of backgrounds. Not all just, you know, geeks and propeller heads not all just MBA people. It's the mix of bringing that variety of people together. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about one critical skill that I think fundamentally predicts whether it be a startup company or even an established company's ability to be successful as we go forward. So at Cable Labs, we spend a lot of time looking across the future. Um, these are some of the work that we do, everything from sensors to immersive medias all kinds of things. And I'm just given that I've only got, this is normally if I was to present this to uh, one of the cable companies like a Comcast or a Time Warner or a Virgin Media in the UK or JCOM in Japan, I would spend eight to 10 hours with the executive team to go through this to kind of give them those insights. Here, I'm gonna do this all in 25 minutes. So I've had to pick out a few that I think are interesting, intriguing, my hope here is that somebody here sees some of these fundamental exponential technologies and you come up with the ideas for what that next thing is going to be. One of the areas that we spend a lot of time thinking about is exponential storage, right? We talk about the amount of memory we have in devices that we carry. In uh, 1997, I was a chief information officer at a startup called Telligent based in Washington, D.C. Part of my role was really to build out all of the, the network and the infrastructure. Intelligent was a fixed wireless carrier, 72 markets in the US, 12 overseas countries. And I bought my first what's called an EMC frame, disk storage frame for use by the services. That entire frame, which was three racks, six feet high, held one terabyte of data, and it cost me $1.4 million in 1996, 1997, okay? Now, let's put that into context, okay? I can even now, I can now fit a terabyte in a Ziploc bag. So this is a Samsung one terabyte SSD drive that you can find in, you know, the laptops you're buying or even in other mobile devices. And just to put that in context again, if you took a, a stack of SD cards to equal one terabyte, that holds one terabyte in the equivalent of SDs, and all for less than 100 bucks. So we've gone from six foot frames, three of them, $1.4 million, to now I can fit a terabyte in a Ziploc bag for less than $100. And that's only the beginning. Two technologies that are listed on this chart, one's called Memristor, the other one's called Biological. Memristor is a technology that actually was invented um, at HP, um, and it's now coming commercial this year. You'll start seeing early um, SD uh, drives that will be coming out based on Memristor. An earlier version of Memristor was really what we used to call memory spot. It's a non-volatile memory. Um, at the early days, it was 256K. They're now up to 256 meg. And what you're seeing, and I'll be around at the break, you can walk up and you can see it a little bit, a little bit clearer, is a literally the dot of a pin, 256 meg, and requires no battery for storage, and it can read and write just as fast as any memory that you would have installed in your laptop or in your, or in your main system. This one fundamental technology will change the whole design of computers five to 10 years out. Think about it from the standpoint that you'll be able to put tens of terabytes, hundreds of terabytes of storage into the same footprint as your mobile phone. And therefore, carry everything with you. No longer, you know, it actually starts to cause things opposite of the cloud. We think we stick things in the cloud because we can't have enough storage on our devices. We back up our pictures because we can't store them all on our phone. With this kind of exponential growth and storage, that changes that entire equation. You literally just will keep everything and you'll never have to delete another photo off your phone in order to make, a, make room for that next photo or that next video. 
What's really exciting also, though, is biological. Harvard uh, Medical School, has, working with MIT, has developed a technology to do biological storage. In one gram of DNA, you now can store 700 terabytes in one gram of DNA. A cup of DNA can store every bit of information ever created by man up until including today in one cup of DNA. Think about the possibilities of now what do you keep versus making decisions on, well, we'll keep this because it's important and we'll get rid of that because of space size, expense, or network. So storage is going to see this absolutely explosive growth over the next three to five to eight years. And it'll have a fundamental change on thinking about networks and storage and what do you keep and what do you use memory for. Another is around color. Now, in the case of cable labs, we do spend a fair amount of time thinking about the overall video experience, the, the visual entertainment that you, that you get in your homes today. What you're seeing here is, is this is a modified display, and I'll apologize for Tara for using the, the, the Apple logo on this because it's actually a hacked um, Apple display in which we were doing experiments uh, on quantum dots. So quantum dots is a very unique material that does light refraction that gives you extremely high accurate color. So what you're seeing, and this, this, this video will loop so you can watch it a couple times, you're seeing sliding in from the right is literally a tube of quantum dots as it slides across a set of blue LEDs with a very specific film on the front. So you can literally see the color come alive. Color is an indication, or at least the human brain perceives color as an equivalent to quality. Better experiences, more richness, better overall um, enjoyment of whatever it is you're watching. When you think about the color spectrum of what the human eye can perceive, there's an industry standard called BT2020. The human eye can perceive about 75% of the colors that are defined by BT2020. Put that in context. The top of the line HD sets that you have today gives you about 38% or about half the perception of the human eye. Quantum dots takes you to about 65% of that quality. To get to 75%, you're talking lasers. Very expensive, but very, very accurate in color representation. We're not there yet. Last year at CES, you saw a bunch of manufacturers announcing quantum dots. That will be the big selling feature. Quantum dots work both in HD, 4K, 8K, and all kinds of new display technology. It's, it's independent. It gives you that rich color representation. The challenge being, though, is, is today we don't shoot videos, movies, films, and TV shows to take advantage of this color. So there's an entire range of technologies that have to be invented to capture that kind of color richness in order to be able to display it on these new, new next generation displays. So we think color is gonna become increasingly important. You're gonna see a complete shift in how films are shot, how TV shows are produced, and ultimately how content gets delivered. Exponential displays. The range of displays. We now have a display that we carry with us all the time. We have displays on our laptops or uh, TVs in our home. What's interesting is, is how we get caught kind of in historical perspectives. You know, we used to have 4x3, the old standard deaf TV that we had in our homes for years. We go to 16x9, which is kind of the standard for HD. In reality, though, 16 by 9 is not in the best aspect ratio for a lot of content. So uh, there's been a number of companies, including Cable Labs, that have been experimenting with a variety of different aspect ratios. This actually is a 30-foot wide display that's actually what we call a double wide. It's two 16 by 9s stitched together. So it's as, as if you took the images from two separate cameras side by side, digitally stitched them together and represent a double wide. We think these are kind of interesting from the standpoint of it changes the viewing experience of certain events. This is actually showing an earth, wind, and fire concert that was captured in 3D. 
So you can sit down in these two chairs on either side, put the goggles on, and literally you feel like you're right in front of the stage at Earth, Wind, and Fire. Um, sports, NBA, doing a lot of work with NBA in this space uh, because now six, double 16 by 9 is the perfect aspect ratio for a basketball game. You don't have to move the camera around. You're not doing shots. You literally put the camera in row five, or if you want that courtside, and you make it feel like you're literally sitting courtside, and you watch that entire experience. We think there's a whole wide range of different kinds of display approaches that need to be thought of. In addition to this, we do a lot of work in uh, virtual reality, full 360 uh, capture and full 360 feedback. We just completed a consumer um, study where we bring, we, it, down in Louisville, we run these studies. We have an ISO lab that does for human perception of video quality and overall experiences. We brought consumers in. We showed them VR 360 content. It was a Taylor Swift music video that got shot 360. And then, oh, it was, a, it was a travel thing where we put a 360 camera right on the edge of this lagoon with elephants. And, in Africa, and you literally were like nose to nose, but you could turn around and look up and look down and basically have a full 360 view. Consumer perception of that versus these really large wide displays, et cetera, VR was off the scale. Like consumer interest in it is highest that we've ever seen in these kinds of experiences, the research that we've done so far. So uh, we're still early in that research, but we think that there's clearly an opportunity there. Exponential manufacturing, printed electronics, 3D printing. We, you know, I'm sure we, everyone's probably pretty familiar with 3D printing. Printable electronics, where you literally use a printing mechanism to print the electronics um, onto a, it could be a solid form or in a plastic form. And I actually did bring one example um, of printable electronics. So this is actually, uh, a test film, this one's gotten a little beat up over the years, um, but this is actually literally a mylar film, it's the same mylar film used as the back plane for flexible uh, solar arrays used by the military, you can roll them out onto the desert. Modified by 3M and then creating a printing mechanism to literally print the electronics right onto the mylar film. So no longer do you have to go through the complexities of prototyping or manufacturing of the, in, a, in a traditional way of, of creating things that require some form of electronic components. So think about it from the standpoint that we think about 3D printing as remote manufacturing. We can build parts that would be shipped and used anywhere in the world. Now you can add, you can add the physical form of a physical device. Now with the ability to print its electronic components and to do the same thing. And then the one area that's probably, the, well, it's the largest area of our research is in exponential bandwidth. Where does bandwidth come from? How do we make more of it? How do we make it faster? How do you make it more reliable? Um, as I shared, 50% of the US homes, the cable industry provides that broadband that uses a technology that's developed and maintained by, uh, by cable labs. But one of the other areas that we've spent a lot of time on is in wireless. Um, Wi-Fi, how do you do better Wi-Fi in your home? How do you get better Wi-Fi um, out in uh, public access areas? Those kinds of things. If you've seen some of the more advanced Wi-Fi access points, you can go into Best Buy and buy, buy them, such as you know, Netgear, Nighthawk, which is probably one of the top of the line access points out there today. You see the little box and you see four antennas kind of poking up from the back of it. What you're seeing here, and what we call those is that's really is an antenna array. Most access points are three by threes or four by fours. You may get a, in research, you may get more. Cable Labs, we fund university research in areas. We've been working with Stanford on massive antenna arrays. This is a picture of a massive antenna array. The ruler on the bottom, that is measuring inches. Literally, now you're talking about thousands of antennas being able to stick it into, the, into a small footprint. What does this do for you? Better over, exponential growth in speed, reduction of interference, and a significant improvement in overall reliability. It will transform the use of Wi-Fi from being this casual service to it just being 
literally the service, that becomes carrier grade. It just is always around you. And we do a lot of work in all kinds of wireless, not just in Wi-Fi, but in other areas. But we think that wireless and, and really this exponential bandwidth become increasingly important. Gigabit, everybody talks about it. Uh, you got Google Fiber, you've got uh, Comcast two gig services now in San Francisco and Atlanta. Um, you're gonna see really this explosive growth. The question that we have for researchers is, is if I give somebody a gig, what do you do with it? And that's the big question. Because today, in everybody that has gigabit on a residential basis, at most they're using a couple hundred megabits at top, and on average you'll use between 45 and 50 on, a, on an average day. So 50 megabytes, but you're, you deliver one gig to somebody's home. What do you do with it? And so we spend a lot of time and we're very interested in, in looking at research in, in areas about what are going to be those next generation services that need those kinds of massive massive bandwidths. Now, the one critical skill when you think about this, and these are only a handful of the technologies, we went through the whole piece, there's probably about 180 technologies that we track today, looking at all their elements and predicting when they have crossover points and when those impacts are going to be. But the key skill that we look for, particularly when we're hiring or when we're working with uh, you know, co-innovation work. We do co-innovation with major tech companies around the world where we come together to uh, uh, come to bring our unique expertise together with others in order to uh, innovate in areas. But the one skill that we look at very closely is this issue of associative fluency. And what we mean by associative fluency is the ability to associate different ideas, different technologies, different socioeconomic shifts that are happening, different political shifts that are happening. And that fluency, the ability to bring those together and identify those opportunities that others do not see. When you think about entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs show associative fluency from the standpoint of what was that spark? What was that unique thing they saw that allowed them to see an opportunity to go create something that turned into being a big success for them? And we look for people who have a very unique skill set in this area of what we call associative fluency. It's those people who look at things differently. The one way we do that is what, by hiring across what we call neural diversity. When you look at problems, right, we all tend to look at the problem the exact same way, particularly if everybody on your team looks just like you. Now, we don't think about it from the context of normal HR diversity. We're talking about truly the ability for people to look at, look at a problem differently. In the case of Cable Labs, we actually do an outreach program and we hire researchers who are on the autism spectrum. Why? Because when you're on the autism spectrum, you look at everything differently. Not just some things, you look at, you know, we have one example. Young gentleman, master's degree from one of the major universities here in Colorado, couldn't get hired by, you know, literally, 50 plus interviews, couldn't find a position. We found him, we hired him. This kid is like smart, like off the scale. All of our research is just like in awe of this kid, right? Those are the kinds of people you, and that feeds into associative fluency, looking at things differently, and making sure teams that are being put together have a wide range of perspectives. And with that, I'm gonna leave a few minutes here. So I got six minutes, right? Yeah, I'm really good. See? I'm gonna land this plane right on time. Because I also know being the last speaker how you always hate people going long. So Tara, who's coming up at the end from Apple, Tara and I worked together at HP. So I told her I, I was teasing, I was gonna hog all her time and leave, and leave Apple with like five minutes at the end. But I know she's the closer and everybody here is an Apple fan, so I'm not gonna won't deny you that. But we got about five or six minutes for any uh, questions you might have. Yes? And yell it loud, please. Where do you see a biological enrichment story here in the next five years? Is it going to be specifically industrial, or will this even remotely migrate into what generally we would find? So the question is, is where do I see biologicals in five years? Is it purely an industrial, or does it actually get into the consumer? Over the next five years, no, I don't think you're going to see in the consumer. 
thinking that you really need to think about it kind of in that eight to ten year window. Uh, if you go off, you can read you can read the Harvard research or the MIT research in the biological. They've done a pretty good job of how they encode it. The compute required to decode it or to read the memory is pretty intense. And they haven't really fully solved that problem as of yet. So think of biological memory storage as really long-term storage. You can write it, and in the rare case that you do need to recover it, you can apply the compute. They're trying to solve that problem, but, and, I, and they've got some good approaches on it, but I would think biologicals from a standpoint of something you would have, you know, start truckish in your pocket, um, you're talking, you know, eight to ten years out before you start seeing some of the early uses of that. Good question. I'll take this one over here. No, I don't think it'll replace it. I think it's going to be an entertainment experience that people are going to find compelling and want to take um, advantage of. What's the real challenge with virtual reality, though, is, is today the VR content, for instance, um, that's captured um, for an Oculus Rift type display um, is really only a 2K wide. But keep in mind, that's 2K from here all the way around to here. So it's not 2K of your viewing angle. The image is 2K and you're seeing a subset. So part of the challenge of really getting a good VR experience is you gotta ramp up the capture resolution, how you film it at a very significant rate. And so now you're seeing you know, 360 cameras that literally each camera is a 4K camera capturing full 4K. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but we think virtual reality is really not something that's gonna replace the TV or display in your home it really gets driven as, as an entertainment experience that I think people are gonna want to experience. And the fact is, is we've got, you know, decades of content shot in traditional formats that don't translate very well. So this is gonna take time until there's enough content that people really want to experience. So, another question right there? It's been an area that they've been looking at as far as how do you do it from a receptive perspective versus you know, displaying color versus how do I detect color. Quantum dots are for projecting color, not for perceiving quality like as a replacement or uh, an ability to do things like artificial sight, those types of things. There are though, however, the equivalent of quantum dots uh, that are being do done on all kinds of image sensors. And so there's a quote, a biological approach that's being applied to image sensors which then would allow for the detection of extreme high quality color and richness and high dynamic range, all the, the geeky terms we like to use when we talk about color. Um, but that's still, it's still in very, very early stages. I'd love for it to, to move faster, but that's an inherent problem that hasn't been, been, been solved as of yet. So we got quite time for one more question right there. The question is, is you know, we talk about you know, computer science, et cetera, um, and its role in this kind of research, what about social sciences? Absolutely. Uh, one, my, 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 my son is a graduate in sociology, so he would want to make sure I, I didn't leave him out. He's also a dual major in anthropology. Um, and then we have an entire research team headed up by Mickey Calkins that does user interface, user experience, so how do you do the human side of understanding you know, those of us on the, on the propeller head, geeky side, we tend to forget about that there's humans that have got to use this stuff. You know, we just all get all enamored with the shiny object stuff. We're going to build that next new shiny object and forget about the fact that at some point a user's got to use this thing. Um, so that's when I talk about cross-functional diversity teams. It's not, you know, it's, you want, you know, in fact, we, in my previous role, we had 100% of our team trained to do field anthropologic research, meaning doing observational studies in homes, watching people using technologies. And that information was just as important as how do we take advantage of this little processor, or what about battery technologies and those kinds of things. So today, the technology is not, you know, that's why I talk about there's the technology for exponential, 
the ability to turn that into exponential innovations requires a much broader team than people traditionally think about. It's not just about the geeks. It's about that ability to get that full perspective of what's the problem you're trying to solve. What is it you're trying to do that's going to help somebody have a better life, solve a problem, be, have a more enjoyable life, be happier. Whatever that objective is, how do you bring that all together? And you need a team that looks at it from the human side, from the technology side, and from the business side. Good. Thank you very much.